of the Torah is that it has two parts. Really, someday I'll talk to you about the third part, but two parts, and what well, is a normal picture. One is the written, which is the Tanakh, the whole of the Tanakh. And the other is the oral, which we have in the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Midrash, the Zohar, Sidur. All of these are part of the Torah Shabbat Peh. A question that people ask, many people ask, where in the Torah Shebechtav, the written Torah, does it say that there is an oral Torah? Where does it say that? I'm going to answer that question, but before I do, I want to explain why I think that it's not a good question. And after we see that it's not a good question, then I'll give an answer. I don't know if that's a good policy, but that's what we'll do. What is the procedure, the process, by which we got the Torah? We went out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt, Moshe Rabbeinu taught some halachot to the people before Sinai, before Ma'amad Sinai, Revelation. He had a book. The book started with Breshit, the whole of the creation, the Avot, the Shvatim, going down to Mitzrayim. And the book goes up to Ma'amad Sinai, roughly Perek Chaf in Sefer Shemot. That's all. That's all. There are some mitzvot there, but out of 613, it's a minority. Then came Ahmad Hasinai, the people all heard God speak and gave them the aserat that they brought, the ten pronouncements. After that, Moshe Rabbeinu came down from the mountain, I'm skipping some events, and started to teach them the Torah that God taught him on Mount Sinai. He did that for 39 years. All Baal Peh, all oral, no book at all. 39 years with no book. At the end of his life, he wrote Sifrei Torah, one for each Shevet. He wrote books of the Torah and gave them, just before he died, he gave them to the tribes. That means that when what we call Chumash, when Chumash came into existence, when it was written, they had a Torah Shabbat Peh for 39 years already. The Torah Shabbat Peh came first. The book came afterwards. Why should you write into the book something which everyone already knows? Everyone is living it already. There's really no point in putting it there. I'll give you an example. You live in the United States of America. There is such a thing as the Supreme Court. You know, any law written anywhere in the United States, the Supreme Court can strike it down say it's unconstitutional, and make it invalid. Nowhere in any law in the United States do you have written, this is the law, this is what you must do, but of course, if the Supreme Court says it's unconstitutional, then the law is invalid. They don't write that down. Why don't they write it into every law? Because everybody knows that. Everybody knows there's a Supreme Court. Everybody knows the function of the Supreme Court. You don't have to write it into every law. Everyone knows that. So why should you write into the Torah Sheb Echtav, there is a Torah Sheb Peh, when the Torah Sheb Echtav came 39 years after the Torah Sheb Peh. We had it, we were talking about it, studying it, learning it, memorizing it, analyzing it, debating it for 39 years. Then the book came. Why should the book talk about that? Something that everybody knows. So I don't think the question is such a good question. 
Why isn't the oral written into the, into the written? Why doesn't the written say there's an oral Torah? I don't think it's such a good question. But the truth is that if you look at the written and look at it carefully, you can see that without the oral, the written cannot be understood. So it's implied. You give a person a book and you say, here are rules, mitzvot, laws. Live with them. Obey them. If you don't, you're going to be punished. You read the laws and you say, but they don't tell me what to do. They don't tell me what to do. I can't follow them because they're not clear. They're not precise. Then there must be something else that agrees with it, comes along with it, supplements it, mashlim. Otherwise, the book can't serve as a law book. For example, Shabbat. Shabbat is very important. It's one of the Aseret Ibrot. Aseret Ibrot. The Torah says 15 times, don't do malacha on Shabbat. Don't do malacha on Shabbat. So, okay. I believe. Ani ma'amin. Ani mekabel. I'm ready. Just tell me, what is malacha? What is it? I won't do it. Just tell me what it is. Nowhere is there a definition what malacha is. Is watering a plant malacha? How do you know? Signing your name, drawing a picture, is that a malacha? Stitching a garment? How do you know? What is malacha? What is not malacha? Nowhere is there a description. Marriage. Marriage is very important. When you get married, all sorts of things change, all sorts of responsibilities. Nowhere does the Torah say how to get married. So, you don't know what to do. Now with divorce, <coughs> with divorce we are very rich. We have six words. The chatav la sefer kritut, the natan biada. Six words. The husband should write a book that cuts off, cuts off between husband and wife, and put it into the hand of the wife. So if the husband is illiterate, he cannot read and write, there can be no divorce, because he can't write it. Can somebody else write it for him? Suppose the wife is in another city. Must he travel to that city and give it to her? Or she travel to him? Can you send it with a messenger? What has to be written? Any words? Any words you like? Some minimum content? Goodbye? Or must it be more detailed than that? Anyone who lives in the real world, when he hears those six words, he shall write her a book, a, a document of cutting off and put it in her hand, will have dozens of questions occur to him, and the text is silent. So how do you do that? We have a festival in the spring, Sukkot, in the fall, Sukkot. One of the things you do is you take four plants and you wave them. One of them is a pre eight hadar. Take a pre eight hadar. Okay. I'm willing. Tell me. Which one is that? An uh, apple, an orange, a peach, a pomegranate, a grape, an olive. What is a pre eight hadar? In fact, in the Hebrew, it's ambiguous. It's either a pre of an eight hadar or it's a pre hadar from an eight. A beautiful fruit from a tree or a fruit from a beautiful tree. How would you know which one it is? Would you pick a citron? Why would you pick a citron? Why is that more beautiful than a Jaffa orange? It's a citron. It always has been a citron. There's never been any debate about it being a citron. Obviously, the text, the words in the Torah are not standing on their own. They're not standing by themselves. Somewhere there is extra information which is being used to supplement. Otherwise, you could not live by that law. That's a very dramatic one, <coughs> which Rashi mentions in his commentary on that verse. Deuteronomy 12, 21, if you want to look it up. Devarim Yutbet Kafalaf. Where the Torah says this. You're coming into Eretz Israel. It's a big country. Maybe you'll want to eat meat. You want to have a barbecue in Tiberia, in Beersheba, in Sfat. Do you have to go to the Beit HaMikdash in Yerushalayim and there slaughter an animal and there eat some of the meat and have it, make it into a korban? 
Or can you make your barbecue with a piece of, with an animal in Be'er Sheva and in Tzvat and in Tveria at home? Must you go to Yerushalayim or not? The Torah says, no, you don't have to. You don't have to. You can make a, a, a bar barbecue in your own backyard. Just, just, the Torah says, slaughter the animal as I commanded you. Slaughter it as I commanded you. So the reader says, oh, okay, fine. I can make my barbecue, just have to slaughter it the way he commanded me. Where did he command me? Where is this commandment? Where is the description, how you slaughter animals? The answer is nowhere. Nowhere, not in the Chomash, not in the Nevi'im, not in the Ketuvim. Nowhere is a description how you slaughter animals. Now imagine getting that book and believing it, pledging allegiance, I want to do what it says. How do you do that? Obviously, the book never stood alone. It never stood by itself. It always had an accompanying information which helped make it practical to put it into, to live by it. Otherwise, you couldn't possibly live by it. The logical point here is this. You can't imagine the book somehow comes into existence, people use it for 300 years, and someone dreams up a balpeh, a commentary, later, hundreds of years later. That's impossible. Because if the book was by itself, if the book didn't have a balpeh together with it, it would not be able to be used as a law book. The book must have had accompanying material, oral material, from the very beginning, impossible to be any other way. So there are clear indications that the Torah Shebechtav had a Torah Shebaalpeh, but it doesn't, it doesn't say, and there's other material outside this book, because as I said at the beginning, there's no point in that, since the oral material came first. <clears throat> this has another very important implication. A double implication. One is, you read a pasuk, and you try to figure out what it means. That's not fair, because that pasuk does not stand alone. First of all, it's part of a big book. Everyone knows you shouldn't quote out of context, pick a, blue, a sentence here and a sentence there. If you pick it out and don't put it into the rest of the book, you can make terrible mistakes. But here it's harder than that because you have to put it into the context of the oral as well. If you don't read the written together with the oral, you're quoting out of context. Even in university, they'll tell you don't quote out of context. It's wrong, intellectually wrong. So it's certainly wrong here, al Vakama. If anything, they learned their rules from us, not we from them. So you have to do the work or go to those who have done the work and written the commentaries where they take from the oral tradition as well to understand the verses that you're reading. If you don't have that, you don't understand the information that you're reading. Does that make it hard? Yes, it makes it hard. Things that are worthwhile are hard. Things that are really worthwhile and valuable are hard. They're not easy. They're not something you do in the commercial between the two halves of the television program or over a cup of coffee. And you want to become a doctor, you don't become a doctor that way. If you want to be a big success in business, you don't become a big success over coffee. You work hard because that's something that's valuable. This is also valuable and it requires hard work. <clears throat> now, a question that many people ask is this. So the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu had a big oral part. And he taught it to the people in his generation. <clears throat> now they taught it to the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. How many years are we talking about? From Moshe Rabbeinu to the Mishnah, which is the first official text after the, after the Torah, everything was oral for 1,500 years. That's a long time. Can we trust that they gave it over from generation to generation in an accurate way, that things were remembered, things were analyzed correctly, things were not misunderstood, forgotten, new material creep in without realizing it. Can we think that it was really accurate over 1,500 years? 
And that's to the Mishnah. If you go to the Gemara, the Talmud, I'm talking about Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, that's another 350 years. It's a long, long period of time. And sometimes when people ask this question, they use as an analogy the party game of telephone. <clears throat> I don't know if you play the game of telephone here. The British call it Chinese whispers. Um, you Here you have 10 people. You give a written message to the per first person. He whispers that message to the second person, the second to the third, the third to the fourth, down to the tenth. Then they ask the tenth one, what did you hear? And he says, of course, what he says has nothing to do with what was given at the top. And it's a big joke, and everybody laughs. And people ask, that's telephone over five minutes. You're talking about telephone over 1,500 years. What hope is there that this will be accurate? Well, first of all, comparing the transmission of Torah from generation to generation, on the one hand, to telephone, on the other hand, is very foolish. Why does telephone work the way it does? Well, first of all, you have to whisper. And you can't whisper a Z, and you can't whisper a V. And the message always has Zs and Vs in it to make it hard. And you can get to whisper it only once. Suppose number one says it to number two, and number two says, I think I heard you say this. Did I get it right or not? You could check. Would that improve the transmission? And of course, the game is played after the third martini. It's a party spirit, and nothing hangs on it. Suppose that it, everyone would get $100 if it went accurately from beginning to end. Do you think that would improve the transmission? And suppose there were five lines of telephone. Each one gets the same message. The ones say to the twos. The twos ask the ones to get it right. Then you stop, and all the twos get together and compare notes. What did you hear? What did you hear? Would that improve the transmission? Of course. And that's what it is. The transmission is going down with a big population, each with its own chains, and they compare with one another, and this is life and death. This is the most important thing in the entire culture. And people who are experts at this get money and fame and authority and responsibility, respect. So it has nothing to do with a telephone game. <clears throat> but more than that, more than that, when we ask about transmitting the oral from generation to generation, we have a false picture. We think of it as an academic subject. Academic subject. There's Shakespeare, and there's Chinese art, and there's economics. This is law that people are living by. People are practicing this law. If you don't get this law right, you're going to lose. You're going to lose money. It's like contract law. If you are a businessman, you hire a lawyer because if you don't hire a lawyer, you're going to lose your shirt. You want to become a doctor, you study what's written about being a doctor because otherwise you won't get certified. These laws were laws that a whole nation lived by. Since they lived by them, it's not likely that they're going to forget them, get confused about them, subtract or add to them, because other people are going to say, I didn't learn that, I learned it differently. I'll give you an example. Suppose the United States decides that the traffic laws should be oral. They destroy all the books of traffic laws and they make them oral. Could you imagine in 150 years someone saying, uh, let's see, red, green. Green, red, all those lights. Lights everywhere. I wonder what they mean. What do red and green mean? Maybe red means you pay a tax. And green means that, uh, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200. I mean, what do they mean? Could you imagine that happening? I don't think so, because if you forget what red and green uh, mean, you're not going to be alive. Green, red means to stop. If you don't know that, you're going to get hit. Of course people are going to remember it, because they're living by it. The 1,500 years from Moshe Rabbeinu to the Mishnah was almost all of it a time when we were living by all those laws. For 70 years of the Galut Bavel. Aside from that, they were living by those laws. Why should we expect that they're going to be forgotten? There's no reason to think they're going to be forgotten. And when we went into the Galut Romi, which we, in a certain sense, are still in, and it get, got longer and longer, that's when the Mishnah was written. Because people did start to forget. So then the Mishnah was written. And then the Talmud Yerushalmi, 100 years after that. And then the Talmud Bavli. 
So you see that when there's a danger of really forgetting, we could write it down because we did write it down. Now logicians have a move called the contrapositive. It works like this. If when we were forgetting it, we wrote it down, so earlier when we didn't write it down, it must be that we weren't forgetting it. Because if we were forgetting it earlier, we would have written it down earlier. We know we could write it down because we did write it down. We wrote it down when we started to forget it. If we didn't write it down earlier, it means earlier, it wasn't being forgotten. That's why we didn't write it down earlier. In addition, if you look at elements of the Torah Shabbat Peh, which are written nowhere, there's not written and there's no hint to them, if you think people forget and get confused and new things come in from the outside and people don't know, then these things should be forgotten or there should be variations. And there are many pieces of the Torah Shabbat Peh where there are no variations at all. Take the Sitran, pre Hadar. Nowhere did anyone in the whole history of Judaism say it could be an orange, or an apple, or a pomegranate. Nowhere. Never. In 3,000 years, no one said that. Now, if people are confused and make mistakes and get, forget, why not? And there are many, many cases like that where there's nothing in the Torah Shebech to tell you what the real law is, and the Torah Shebaal Peh is absolutely uniform. A friend of mine, a physicist, suggested the following thought, which I think is very brilliant. Sometimes you can't mix things. Mix milk and meat, as you know. Linen and wool in your garments, as you know. Some of you know anyway. Some things you can't mix. Each one is okay, but the mixture is no good. The Torah says three times, Lo tevashel gedi b'chalevi mo. Don't cook an animal in its mother's milk. Don't cook an animal in its mother's milk. The rule of kashrut has nothing to do with the mother. Any kosher meat in any kosher milk is forbidden. The pasuk says don't cook in the mother's milk. The halakha is, it's generalized much more broadly than that to any kosher meat and any kosher milk. Okay, now what about linen and wool? Don't mix linen and wool in your garments. You could generalize that also. Linen is a plant. Wool is an animal product. Why not say, don't mix plant and animal products in your clothes. So, don't take a piece of leather and sew cotton into it. That's also plant and animal. No one ever said that. No one ever said that. No one ever dreamed of it. Why is it that in milk and meat, it got generalized much more broadly, and everybody agrees? And with uh, linen and wool, it did not get generalized, and everybody agrees that it's not generalized. If people are forgetting, and they get confused, and they, and they add things to subtract things without being aware of it, why is all of this so consistent? In addition, we have from archaeology some, some interesting pieces of evidence. The Talmud Bavli, the first place where it says, which way do you daven? Which way does a synagogue face? Some people think synagogues face east. That's a mistake. Synagogues face Eretz Israel. So in Russia, they face south. In Johannesburg, they face north. In Svas, they face south. Yerushalayim. Whichever way it will be, I suppose that means in, in Persia, they face the west. They're facing Yerushalayim. Synagogues all over the world, which we found from archaeology, going back to Bayit Cheney 2,000 years ago, all face Yerushalayim. They all face Yerushalayim. That's 500 years before it was ever written down. Why aren't there different opinions and different practices and different ways of doing it? Zero. No disagreement whatsoever. Tefillin. What does the Torah say about tefillin? Take these words and put them on your arm and put them between your eyes. Does it say anything about leather boxes? Leather parchments? Black? Straps? Doesn't say anything. Did you ever see or hear of anyone do it with plastic? With wood? With, with uh, garments? No. Only leather. Why? Because the Torah Shabbat Peh was kept very well. It was kept very well. It was kept very accurately. Very clearly and very consistently. Now, at this point I want to make a, 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 a remark about logic. If someone says, I hear everything you said, but I still don't believe it. 
I don't believe it. I think it was mixed up. I think it got forgotten. I think it got changed. I think it's fair to ask him, why do you believe that? Do you have any reasons for believing that? Do you think of yourself as believing it because it's true or because you like cheeseburgers? You think it's true? Well, give me a reason. I gave you reasons to think it's accurate. You think it's not accurate? Show me why. I want to hear reasons. I have challenged over 40 years, challenged people to show me reasons why you think that it was forgotten and mixed up and changed and so forth and so on. I'm still waiting for an answer. So that being the case, we have every reason to trust that it was kept very well. I don't say perfectly. Our sources say some things were forgotten. Our sources say some things were, were, uh, were misunderstood. Some, but a very small percentage. 3%, 4%. The vast, vast majority is unanimous. The vast, vast majority is kept consistently. And that being the case, if you have any particular item, you have every right to trust that that particular item was reproduced accurately. Now, there's one more major question that I want to talk about, and then I'll have some time for, uh, for, for questions that you may have what I said or other things. There are many rabbinic laws. The rabbis made up laws of their own. The Torah gives them the authority to do this. It's based on psukim. Sometimes the rabbis made up a law for a purpose. They said, do or don't do this because we're protecting that. And you could see in their time, in their time, the law they made protected the thing that was important. But over time, that became disconnected. The law no longer protects that thing anymore. It doesn't serve that purpose anymore. Why should I keep a law when the purpose of the law no longer applies? For example, there's a law not to ride horses on Shabbat. Why not? If you look at the malachot, no malacha is riding a horse. There's no problem with that. But people, when in those times, when they rode a horse, took a branch of a tree to use to guide the horse with. Pulling a branch off a tree is a malacha. So the rabbi said, we know that people who ride horses pull branches off the tree. So if they pull branches off the tree, then we'll have to stop them from riding horses so they won't pull branches off the tree. Fine. No one today who rides a horse pulls a branch off a tree. He has a Christian Dior switched it, I think he goes out in his the fancy French clothes, and he goes out to ride. Nobody pulls off branches from trees anymore. So why should we keep a law which was made for a purpose when the law doesn't serve that purpose anymore? That's one of the people who complain about the Tosh Abalpeh, think is a very, very important question. I don't think it's such a good question. I don't think it's a good question because even in a secular system, even in an atheist system, you wouldn't follow that logic. You wouldn't follow that logic. I'll give you an example. In 1973, there was a war, an Arab-Israeli war. During that war, there was an Arab embargo of oil. Arabs stopped shipping oil to the United States. I lived through those periods, that period. The price of, uh, of gas at the pump doubled, more than doubled. There was gas rationing in this country. You could only buy gas three days a week. If you had an odd license number, it was these three days, an even license number, those three days, one day a week was closed. And the national speed limit was 55 miles an hour. That was a national law. The maximum speed was 55 miles an hour. Now imagine, this didn't happen this way, but imagine the following happens. The Arabs give up the embargo in uh, February. They start shipping oil. In March and April, the oil starts reaching, the crude oil starts reaching the United States. They start refining it, and in July, the new gas hits the pumps, the price drops. And here's George, roaring down the highway at 75 miles an hour. So the policeman pulls him over and says, what's the matter with you? Speed limit is 55 in the whole country. Do 75? <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna slaughter you. And he says, don't you understand? They put in the 55 mile an hour speed limit because of the oil embargo. But there is no oil embargo. They finished it. We have plenty of gas. The price of gas has gone down. There's no reason for the law anymore. Will he get off? Will he avoid the ticket? 
No, he will not. Because if the Congress passes a law, it stays a law until Congress takes it back. You say the purpose no longer applies? So what? Congress has to take it back. And in July, Congress doesn't take it back because in July, Congress is in China climbing the Great Wall, and they're in, in, in Beersheba, they're in, they're in Eilat scuba diving. Congress doesn't get back till October, November. So for months, it's going to be that the law is going to be in effect without a purpose. No one thinks that when the purpose stops, the law stops. There is no such concept. And as a matter of fact, the 55 mile an hour speed limit was kept in place for another 20 years because they discovered that it serves other purposes. It reduces death for, and injury from like, accidents and the rest. So someone says, the rabbis passed a law, it doesn't serve the purpose, so it should be void and we should just not keep it anymore. You wouldn't do that in secular law either. You don't trust that it doesn't serve the purpose, you wait for the legislature to change it. Okay, the fallback position of the critic will be, all right, I understand you, waiting from July to November is reasonable. But we haven't had a Sanhedrin in 1,600 years. That's a long time. A law passed by the Sanhedrin would have to be taken back by the Sanhedrin. Must we wait more than 1,600 years to, to get to, to, a, to a change? Isn't there a point at which sooner or later you should say, okay, okay, we don't have the Sanhedrin, we'll take things into our own hands and change it on our own without a Sanhedrin. I think that's a good objection if you assume that there is no God, the Torah did not come from God, the laws are made up by people, and if they're made up by people, they can be changed by people. That's a good objection if you start with the assumption that there is no Torah min HaShamayim, that the Torah did not come from God. But suppose you start with the opposite assumption that we start with, that the Torah did come from God. Let's try a little exercise of logic. God said, there's a Sanhedrin, and when they make a law, you have to follow it. God said, to take back a law from the Sanhedrin, must have a Sanhedrin. Only a Sanhedrin can take back a law that a Sanhedrin passed. And God said, I'm running history. I'm running history. The fact that you lost the Sanhedrin is an accident. It's not an accident. I deprived you of the Sanhedrin. I took it away from you because I ran history so that you would lose it. Now let's try to put two and two together and get four. God says the Sanhedrin is binding. God says only the Sanhedrin can take back a law of the Sanhedrin. And God said, I took away the Sanhedrin. What's the message? The message is, I don't want you to take back any laws. Let's try that again. God said, I made the Sanhedrin and made it binding. I told you a law of the Sanhedrin can be taken back only by another Sanhedrin, and I took away the Sanhedrin. The message is, I don't want you to change those laws. So of course the laws aren't going to change. And if the purpose of the law no longer applies, so what? If God wanted us to be able to change it when the purpose doesn't apply, he would have given us a Sanhedrin to change it with. If he took away the Sanhedrin, he's telling us, I don't want you to change those laws. Now, a critic who assumes that it doesn't come from God, he's on a different page. But he has no critique of us. Our practice is not under critique. Our practice is not being shown to be inadequate in any way. Our practice is perfectly consistent. However, given all of that, there are times when what we do does change. Notice I changed my vocabulary, paying attention. What we do does change with times. And that's what the final thing I want to explain to you. The Talmud says, if you have, let's say, water, <clears throat> and you leave it uncovered and unattended, you have a glass of water, you walk into another room and come back 20 minutes later. No one was there and the water is unattended, you must not drink it. Why not? Because in those days, there were snakes and scorpions that were common in their habitations. Snakes and scorpions are poisonous. If they drink from the water, they could leave behind traces of their poison. And the water could be dangerous. So the Talmud says, don't drink it. The Shulchan Aruch says it's perfectly all right to drink it. Perfectly okay. Shulchan Aruch was written by Rabbi Yosef Karo in Tzfas, in Eretz Israel, in the 16th century. I guess there were no snakes and scorpions in their habitations at that time. But that means that it changed. It changed. 
I just explained to you why things don't change, and now it did change. Why is that? The answer is, you have to understand what is the law and what is the application of the law. And if you look at it from those terms, you'll see that it's perfectly consistent. In the case of riding the horse, the law is don't ride horses, period. Now there's a footnote, a thousand pages later in the back where the footnotes are. It says, this law was made because people pulled down branches from trees. That's why it was made. But the law is don't ride horses. Laws don't change. The only thing that could change the law is the Sanhedrin. We don't have a Sanhedrin. Laws don't change. So now, even though no one pulls down branches, you can't ride horses. But in the case of the uncovered liquids, the law is don't take chances with your health. Don't take chances with your health. That law is a law. That law doesn't change. But what is dangerous might change. In Talmudic times, uncovered, unattended water was dangerous. So the law that says don't take chances with your health would say don't drink that liquid. Today, when it's not dangerous, the law stays exactly the same. Don't take chances, but this isn't a chance anymore. Since it isn't a chance anymore, the practice can change. That's why I said the practice can change. What we do change is the law never changes. But you have to know what the law is. And sometimes there can be a debate about what the law is. So if you're not in danger of injury or in danger of death, taking medicine on Shabbat and Yom Tov is usually something which we try to avoid. How much should you avoid it? Well, the purpose of avoiding it was, in those days, medicines were stored as solids, and when you used them, you ground it into a powder, and then you took it. Grinding a solid into a powder is a malacha. So they said, if it's just a headache, or just a toothache, it's nothing serious, not, nothing dangerous, don't take a medicine because you might grind, and grinding is a, is a biblical malacha. Some people are very stringent about this, very strict about this, and other people are more lenient, more, more relaxed about it. What's the difference? One difference is how you picture the law and the application. One says, the law is, don't take medicine. That's the law. A thousand pages later, where you have the footnotes, it says, that's because you might grind a solid into a powder. But the law is, don't take it. So today, when no one grinds solids into powders, it makes no difference. The lawyers don't take medicine. The other one says, no. The law is, be careful about grinding. Be careful about grinding. Don't take chances of grinding. So when you grind solids into powders to take medicine, then you have to be careful about medicines, because that's something which might lead you to grind. But when you, uh, when you don't grind anymore, you come already pre-prepared, so then you're not taking a chance about grinding. In each case, you have to ask, what is the law and what is the application? The laws never change, but you can debate, discuss what the law actually was. That, I think, explains why the laws are the way they are, and uh, why sometimes the th uh, what we do changes, and sometimes why, why it doesn't. I hope that this little discussion uh, shows you, number one, that we have good reason to trust that the law is original, much of it goes back to Moses, that it was preserved and transmitted accurately over time, and that people have thought about this. People have worked out understanding of this. People have theories of this. This is not just something people do because they did it before, they don't think about it, and they're too intellectually lazy, intellectually very vigorous, very vigorous and very critical, and thought things through in great care. And there's a great deal of logic, and this should encourage you to study some of the Torah Shabbat Peh and study the foundations of the Torah Shabbat Peh. A very good book, which when I was exploring Torah Judaism as a college student, I was not brought up in a religious home, The Oral Law by Harry Schimmel. Harry Schimmel is a barrister in, in England, and it's still in print. If you want to see some of these ideas written out with care with all the sources, original Hebrew sources and then translated into English. He's very careful as a scholar. And it's still in print. You can still get it from Amazon. Uh, I would highly recommend it. And you could see some of this written out in a way that you can easily read and have it available for you. Now, if there are questions over the next period of time, I'll be glad to try to, to answer them. Yes? Yeah. Um, how do you explain how, like, 
the, there's different versions of the Talmud. Uh, there's like one the box says, oh, it says like I got mine like this, and then there's another one that's like, but he said, I think it should be like this. I know these are Rishonim, but. Uh, the, the, the Talmud has in it 5,400 pages. It was copied by hand by people who wanted to make copies. And they made mistakes. They are human beings and they made mistakes. And I remember when I was becoming religious, so critics for conservative reform used to say, oh, you people worship the Talmud. You don't know that they made mistakes here, made mistakes there, and things got changed. You know very well, on every page of the Talmud, there are emendations, places where it says, the text should be this, the text should be that. They discuss and debate the text. Our own scholars know that. And they did manuscript work all over the world, and they have lim uh, uh, written, uh, written out comments where the manuscript is discussed. One of the greatest pleasures you can have, uh, if, you're if you're studying the Talmud, you read a piece of Talmud and it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't hold together and you're lost. You look at one of the commentaries and he says, this word is wrong, it should be a different word. And then suddenly it makes sense beautifully. You think, wow, I'm not so stupid. The way it's written, it doesn't make sense. Because the text wasn't right, the text was a different text. Maimonides often, when there's a contradiction between Maimonides and the Talmud, they look to see with maybe he had a different, different edition. By the way, just a little, a little footnote. If there's a contradiction between Maimonides and the Talmud, who wins? Maimonides wins. Hmm. You see, he has a black hat and a beard, so it's not fair. He's advanced. Of course, Maimonides wins. Because if he differs from this section of the Talmud, it means either there's another section someplace else, and he's relying on that other section, or his text of the Talmud was different, or you think it's a contradiction, but your logic is wrong, you always go with the later source. Because the later source took the earlier source into account. He used the earlier source, and he, had, he arrived at the opinion that he arrived. It's not a question of who has greater authority. Of course the Talmud has greater authority than Maimonides. But Maimonides used the Talmud. He really relied on the Talmud. That's why. See, that's good. If you, go, if you study a while, you get answers like that. Yeah. So if he does quote it, and you see that it's different from what we have in our Talmud, then you have it open and shut. That's very easy. Often it isn't that way. Often it's, you have to struggle to, to, uh, to see you know, how it goes. Yeah. So um, is there a limit, for example, going to the grinding one? If you open up a bottle of medicine, you got to squeeze the plastic hard and then spin it. And that physically does grind a little bit. It wears it down. So like when you start walking on Shabbat, then wouldn't you be grinding your shoes? Yeah. So like at what point do you stop? Do you stop at like what you can see? Or the oh, so this, very good, very good. The, there's a principle in Jewish law. If you can't see it, it doesn't exist. If you can't see it, it doesn't exist. The last 200 years, there are at least three different sfarim which say this in, in those words. That means you found with, my, with, with um, um, uh, my, uh, microscopes that there are bacteria in the water, doesn't matter, it doesn't exist. My daughter lives in, in New York, maybe you heard about the microbes in the water in New York and the filters that they use. I asked her, how did you discover that there are these things in the water? She says, if you put a, wa a paper filter on the water, you see it comes out with black, black spots. So I said, so what? Black spots are black spots. How do you know it's something alive? She said, if you come back a half hour later, the spots have moved. Oh, the spots move? I guess they're alive, <laughs> right? That's sliding, <laughs> they moved. So, but you've gotta be able to see it. So if you can't see it, it's not there. Maybe you take an etrog, to a Rav to check for you. Sometimes he uses a magnifying glass. If you look very carefully, you watch him, you see this is what he does. He looks at the etrog with a magnifying glass, then he takes the magnifying glass away, and he looks at it with the naked eye. If he can't see it with the naked eye, it's not there. The halacha depends upon what you can uh, observe with your senses, with your unaided senses. So that's, that's certainly correct. Now, there's another thing. Suppose you walk across a lawn and you look down at your feet and you see that your shoes have pulled up grass. 
Suppose that happens every time. Every time. But does this happen on every step? Probably not. You take 100 steps and you have four blades of grass. That means 96 steps did nothing. You are allowed to take each step separately. Am I going to pull up grass on this step? Chances are no. Take the step. And you go step by step. The fact that you know that in 100 steps you're going to pull up, doesn't matter. That's discussed in the halakha explicitly. It has to be something which this action will perform, not that will accumulate over time. This grinding that you say for the, the plastic and the shoes and everything else, it's, you can't see it visibly. And you can only see the accumulation over a long period of time. Each step has to be judged by itself. Let's joke about combing your hair. Some people think you can't comb your hair on Shabbat. Um, only if you know that when you pull the ha hair, you're definitely going to pull out hairs, which could be. Which could be. But if, but if it's one in ten strokes, a hair comes out, Nothing wrong with it. Uh, yes? Uh, so does that apply to, you know, if you don't see it, like, does it apply to strawberries and blackberries if you don't see any bugs on there, or like lettuce also? Because you can't really see it with the naked eye. It does, but you have to be very careful. You, you have to be trained how to look with the naked eye. Some of them are the same color as the leaf. So if you look very careful, very casually, you won't see them. If you, if you soak it in water that has either vinegar in it, or so, then, then you see they float to the surface. You didn't see it on the leaf, but you can see them on the surface of the water. So that, that's certainly good enough, right? They're, they're visible, they just aren't visible in that background. So, but this is all, it, it's, it's worked out in the halakha, and halakha is not my field, my field is philosophy. But, but I, I just know enough to, to be able to give examples. Uh, yes? Um, the Jewish history in the Mark uh, discusses a certain sect of the Jews, the Tzidduki, people who didn't believe in the moral law. Um, and those people go back 2,000 years. I think there's a story in the Gemara of a Kohen who after 80 years became a Tzaduki. So, I mean, it, it just seems so strange that you present like, a really large argument as to like, why no one should believe this, but even going back 2,000 years, a Kohen mm -hmm. could could believe that there's no law. So that's always something that just Okay, this is a very, very important point. It's important for itself, and it's important across the board. I want to teach you something now, a real, real strong prejudice, but I think it's worthwhile. A real strong prejudice. Sorry. If you have such a good argument, how come so many people disagree? How come so many people disagree? Let me ask you a question. What are there more of in the world, Jews or anti-Semites? Is that a hard question? There are at least hundreds of millions of anti-Semites, right? Now, they believe that Jews are all evil. Hundreds of millions of people believe that Jews are evil. Does that bother you? Do you find it hard to sleep at night? Maybe they're right. Hundreds of millions of people. I have a suggestion. Don't count people, count reasons. A hundred million people with one reason, count for one. One person with three reasons counts for three. Don't count people, count reasons. People are really, very often, irrational. They're irrational for all sorts of reasons. It pays, it works out their angers, their fits. It gives them the freedom to do what they want. How many people do I know who resist Torah from Sinai because they love cheeseburgers? And they love polo on Shabbat. And they don't want to hear the arguments. And they're full of all sorts of irrational objections because they don't want to give up football on Shabbat. So don't count people, even intelligent people. In the, in the 1890s and 1900s in Germany, there were universities where you couldn't join a student group unless you signed that you're an anti-Semite. You had to sign you're an anti-Semite to join a university student group. University students are the smartest of the smart, right? They're the smartest ones, the best ones. And they had to sign that they're anti-Semites. So being smart doesn't mean you're not prejudiced. Being smart doesn't mean you're always logical. Don't count people, count reasons. Now, what happened to that Kohen Gadol? I don't know. I don't know what happened to him. But did he have a reason? Did he present a reason? Let's see it. Let's see the reason and let's deal with it. If you just know that he did that, but he didn't, we don't have any reasons for him, there's nothing we can do with it. I want to hear reasons. That's my, that's my business. My business is reasons. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, for, for the critic, there's no argument against it. So we presented arguments that why we should believe it and there's no argument. How about the simple fact that there are arguments in the text? There are places where there's no end. There, there's no answer. There's not focus. 
Okay, now, I, I don't know if you want to e ask the question exactly that way. Even if there were an end, even if there were a settlement, you should ask, but why was there an argument in the first place, right? So it's not the question that they don't have an end. The question is where the arguments come from. Uh, if you'll take each argument and ask, how much are you taking for granted in common that you agree on in order to set up that argument, you'll see that what you're taking for granted in common is far, far more. I talked about the citron, right? There's a machloket in the Mishnah. One, I think it's Rabbi Yehuda, who says a lemon is also good. A lemon is also good. Too bad we don't agree with him because it would break the market. <laughs> They'd be very cheap if you could use lemons instead of citrons. Right? Why? Because he says lemons and citrons are one species. And the others disagree with him that it's not one species. But no one says orange, and no one says peach, and no one says pear, and no one says apple, and no one says grape, and no one says olive. Right? So you have one disagreement with hundreds of agreements. That's a very, very small percentage. I said some things were forgotten. Some things did get confused. There's no question. All our sources agreed to that. But when you talk about how much it is, together with another example, when does Shabbat end? So some people say 35 minutes, uh, 42 minutes, 72 minutes, uh, various times when Shabbat ends. One great world religion puts the Shabbat of Breshit on Fridays. You've heard of them. That's the Muslims, right? And another great world religion puts the Shabbat of Breshit on Sunday. Two billion of them, Christians. That's a big difference. We have a difference of about 90 minutes against three days. So yeah, all right. And who says to start the day in the evening? Start the day in the morning, start the day at noon, or at midnight. We have no difference of opinion about that. So when you take each, this, each machloket, each difference of opinion, and ask how much is, ki is in common that everybody agrees on, behind that machloket you see that the, what's, what's in common behind it is far, far, far more material than the, what, the, what the difference of opinion is. Okay, are we going second times now? Nobody, nobody's there? I answer for, I, I'll answer, take questions from this side also. If you want to ask a question. Yes? Um, why would Rabbi Cairo's logic with regards to um, the law of governing water not apply? Why wouldn't he use that same logic with the horse riding on Shabbat? The law is still the same. You can't pull uh, the ranch off the tree, but like you said, nobody's going to be pulling the ranch off the tree. Let's review it, let's review it. I'm glad we'll have an opportunity to, to review it again. The law we're talking now is the rabbinic law. The rabbinic law is designed to protect against violating a biblical law. Pulling the branch down is the biblical law. We're not talking about that one. We're talking about the law about riding horses. If the rabbis made a law, a law don't ride horses, laws never change. So that law is gonna stay until there's another Sanhedrin to take it back. I contrasted that with the water because there the law was not don't drink water. The law was don't take chances with your health. That's the law. That law does not change. Don't take chances with your health. But uncovered liquids aren't dangerous anymore. So that law doesn't apply to uncovered liquids anymore. If you thought the law was don't drink under uncovered liquids, if you thought that was the law, then it would be just like not riding horses. You couldn't change it. But if the law is don't take chances with your health, then you're allowed to drink the liquids because you're still keeping the same law. That's the difference. It's not the law of take, pulling down branches. That's not relevant. Uh, who hasn't spoken yet? Anybody has? Yeah, yeah. Really good question. Um, you mentioned that, I mean, you mentioned that people didn't forget because it was their way of living, right? And then you gave that example of the red light and green light. So what could have caused I mean, that's something so simple. What could have caused a whole nation to stop to stop following that notion? You get what I'm saying? Like, what caused the Jews to start, you know, if, it, if that was the, their way of living and if it was so simple, what made them make the decision to translate it into text? Because that's their way of living. Uh, uh, the, the answer is this, because once they, the, the Romans conquered, destroyed the temple, and put us into exile, many of the laws weren't being practiced anymore. Many of the laws are only practiced in the land of Israel. Many of the laws apply to the, te to the temple. Many of the laws apply to the king. All those things we stop doing. So you stop doing them, then you're gonna to start to forget them. 
That's exactly why. It was because we started to forget them that these things happened. Well, uh, I think uh, Ma'ar is supposed to be at, at, at nine? Should, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I think we'll leave it at here. Okay. Okay.